All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Rachel Robinson, and I am the Director of Preservation at PPS. Uh, we had a robust kickoff to the um, 2020 Providence Symposium last week, so we're very glad to have you join us for the full week uh, of events um, beginning tonight. So welcome and thank you for We want to first take a moment to acknowledge that the Providence Preservation Society is situated upon the ancestral and unceded lands of the Narragansett Nation. This acknowledgement reminds us of the significance of place, the continued existence of indigenous peoples, and PBS's commitment to building respectful relationships with those who call these lands home today. This year's symposium explores the systems and inequities that have shaped our built environment and the communities that inhabit it. This is a response to the events of the past year and a reflection of ongoing conversations within the preservation community about reorienting the movement uh, around the questions that people care about. What places have historically been prioritized? What needs to change moving forward? We're doing this to affect meaningful change in our neighborhoods and cities. The interdisciplinary approach to this year's symposium gives us a framework for thinking about intertwined issues such as climate change, housing, design, transportation, reflective diversity, and historic preservation, and to conceive possible solutions. The next program in the symposium is What Needs to Change, and that takes place tomorrow at 3 p.m. Free tickets are still available on our website, but you need to register by 10 a.m. in the morning if you are not an all access, all access pass holder. We hope you'll join us for what promises to be a lively panel discussion. Today's session is being recorded. Please enter your questions in the chat box and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Please remember to keep your camera and microphone off during the program. We want to thank our many sponsors for supporting this year's Providence Symposium. Check them out on our website and do what you can to patronize them. And now as a former undergraduate poli sci major and a frequent public meeting attendee, I am very pleased to welcome Professor Catherine Levine Einstein. You can read more about Catherine on our website. Today, she will dig into the topic of neighborhood defenders. I believe most people were aware that our city of Providence, like so many across the country and around the world, was experiencing a housing crisis even before current pandemic and recession. But what does that really mean? Who are the stakeholders? What responsibility do we as citizens, as citizens have to demand or affect change? What role can preservation play in housing? To address these questions, Catherine will speak for about 45 minutes, leaving time at the end for your questions. Catherine, I will now turn it over to you to tackle this daunting but important topic. Thank you so much. I'm just going to get my screen share going here. Um, I am so delighted to be here um, and have this opportunity to, um, to share this research with you all. And um, I'm really looking forward to learning from you guys um, and the questions that you have. So what um, my co-authors and I at Boston University um, were really interested in understanding was how the housing permitting process creates political inequalities. We really wanted to understand how the way that we build housing in the United States and the way that we regulate land use shapes politics. Um, and so what I'm presenting for you guys today is work from our co-authored book, Neighborhood Defenders, Participatory Politics and America's Housing Crisis. Um, and I think in many ways, um, this work, for me at least, feels even more relevant as we have started to have a real reckoning um, in this country with our sort of 
dark history and continued expression of systemic racism. And one important question that we should all interrogate as we think about the way that housing permitting happens in the United States and the way that housing is built is whether the way that we think about local politics is actually consistent with our ideals around race. Um, and so here I just provide you guys one example from a suburban community, Weston, outside of Boston, um, where on the one hand, the individual at this home um, is a supporter of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, but on the other hand is fighting um, the Weston Whopper as an affordable housing development proposed in the town of Weston. And so really thinking about this potential disjoint between the way that we think about housing in our local communities and the way we think about systemic racism more broadly in this country. Um, and where I want to start us in thinking about the housing permitting process, I want to start this with this lovely um, abandoned warehouse in Porter Square in Cambridge. Um, so it's right near a mass transit stop in a, in a very dense sort of residential and commercial area. Uh, so in 2015, a developer purchased this abandoned warehouse, um, and his plan was to convert it into four condominium units, each of which would have one parking space. Um, because he was proposing converting a residential residential use into a commercial use. He had to get a special permit, which meant that he had to go before the Cambridge Planning Board. Um, and so for folks who've been to these meetings before, what I'm going to describe to you is going to be very familiar, right? So he goes um, and he provides a very technocratic presentation um, of his plans to the Planning Board. And then the Planning Board asks a series of sort of detail-oriented but broadly supportive questions of the project. At that point, after the planning board has had the opportunity to ask the developer questions, the proceedings then turn over to members of the public whose views are explicitly solicited as part of this process. And here is some of what they had to say. Um, so they were uniformly opposed to this, this development. Um, one person complained um, that they felt that there was too little parking being proposed for the project. Another who is actually a lawyer who lived in the neighborhood came prepared with handouts that she handed out to everyone to explain that this project actually did not um, sort of comply with zoning in the way that the developer claimed. Others worried about structural engineering issues that would come from building parking spaces underneath the building. After hearing from these neighborhood concerns, the members of the planning board told the developer that they needed to provide a parking study and an engineering study and that they should come back in a few months after talking to the neighbors and doing these studies um, and seeing sort of um, where things stood. So the developer does those things. Um, they do the two studies, each of which can cost about $10,000. And they you know, have the carrying costs for the three months um, between meetings. And then they come back and they say, OK, we've talked to the neighbors. We've done these studies. And instead of building four condominium units, now we're going to build three. And instead of one parking space per unit, now we're going to have two. And so one question that we are really interested in understanding, right? One thing that we really want to interrogate here is whether this is good, right? On one level, maybe this is an example of a developer um, having to listen to the neighborhood and sort of, this is a great example of neighborhood back and forth with a developer that yielded a better project. On the other hand, what this may actually be is an example of the most privileged segments of a community coming forward to make it more challenging to build housing in their neighborhood. And that we might be concerned at if this process is repeated hundreds and hundreds of times over, or if we're thinking in the country as a whole, thousands and thousands of times over, it might start to have a really marked effect on the housing supply in the places that are highest opportunity. And so this is really the central question that we try to evaluate in our book is these kinds of hearings and the effects that they have on politics and the effects that they have on the nation's housing supply. So thinking about this in a more general way, land use regulations create opportunities for neighborhood defenders to stop or delay developments, both big and small. And what we find sort of to preview um, our chief findings is that it contributes to exploding housing costs in high opportunity areas. And it creates obstacles to constructing dense multifamily developments in walkable transit oriented communities. The political consequences, though, are just as important. These land use regulations we find empower an unrepresentative group of older white homeowners to essentially control their neighborhoods. 
Finally, the way that we do housing permitting in the United States may also lead to fragmented housing reform coalitions that make it harder to you know, promulgate policy change at the local level and at the state level. And so to dig into this a little bit more, um, again, this, this may be familiar to folks who have been to these hearings and you know, have been a part of this process in depth. Um, but one thing I really wanna emphasize is that in most cities, land use regulations mean that if you want to build more than one unit of housing, more often than not, you're going to find yourself part of the public hearing process. And what this means is that neighbors and abutters are officially invited to participate in this process. Um, in many communities, there's actually explicit provisions that empower neighborhood associations and neighborhood councils. Um, other communities actually explicitly empower property owners as opposed to renters. So some states actually only mandate that a butter notifications are sent to property owners and not to renters, right? Um, and so my, our research on this conversation tonight is primarily about housing, um, but I wanna just emphasize that this is actually not a process that is just limited to housing development. Development. This kind of process shapes whether or not restaurants get permitted, whether or not we can have bike lanes, where mass transit stops get situated. This kind of neighborhood oriented process is really part and parcel of like urban planning in America. Right. So we wanted to really get a sense of what's going on in these meetings. They're so important to the housing development process. And so what we did is we went into the meeting minutes. We actually dug into the documents that are produced after these meetings to understand over a reasonable time frame what went on, who participated, what did they say, and how does it shape housing development. Um, and so to do this, we downloaded all planning and zoning board meeting minutes for three year period for 97 cities and towns in Massachusetts. And we collected data from all meetings that discuss the construction of more than one housing unit. So this could be anything from an accessory apartment or some other form of infill development to large apartment complexes. We were looking at the development of housing units, both big and small. So the meeting minutes from these towns, and this is actually the reason we focused on Massachusetts, it's not that we're based in Boston, it's that open meeting laws in Massachusetts require an unusual level of detail to be provided in these meeting minutes, which is really important for our research design. Um, so the meeting minutes for these towns featured the names, addresses, and the positions taken on proposed housing developments. And what was especially unusual about Massachusetts is consistently across these almost 100 cities and towns Towns, these data provided addresses, which I'll get to in a minute, sort of why that's useful for data analysis purposes. Um, in about 50% of cases, these minutes were incredibly detailed and actually provided the reasons that folks either supported or opposed proposed housing developments. So we were able to learn information about 3,300 commenters who made a total of 4,200 comments over this three-year period. And so for folks who maybe are familiar with Massachusetts geography, maybe this map is helpful to you. I want to just, there are two sort of important points I think to take away from this map. And the first is that um, we were able to get comments from an incredible breadth of places. So we were getting, um, we were able to get data from a variety of cities and towns in Eastern and Central Massachusetts. And we're not just looking at really privileged and homogenous white suburbs. We also look at more diverse communities and communities that have housing markets that are quite different than the city of Boston. So places like Worcester and Lowell um, and Lawrence. Um, so they're all places that we study as well. The second thing to take away from this map is the incredible range in sort of how, um, how many comments um, occur at these meetings. So in some cities and towns, um, their public meetings aren't all that active. You maybe see 15 comments over this three year period. Um, and in other places, we see this really highly active meeting dynamics where over 25 people over a three year period made comments at these hearings. Um, so again, there's like a really big range in how these meetings unfold. Um, and there's also a big range in the kinds of communities that we studied for this research.
So just from reading these thousands of pages of meeting minutes, we can actually learn a lot doing nothing other than reading these meeting minutes. We were able to identify the positions taken and the reasons folks gave um, for either supporting or proposing opposed housing developments. And this is really useful information. Prior to our study, there had actually been no systematic data on whether people showed up to these hearings in support um, or opposition to new housing. I think we all probably had our intuitions if you'd attended these meetings, but having hard data is really important for sort of understanding what these meetings function are and whether they're working or not. But the really powerful thing about uh, Massachusetts meeting minutes is because they included addresses and names, we were able to merge the individuals in these meeting minutes with other administrative data sets. So we were able to use the Massachusetts voter file and core logic property records to learn a lot of demographic information. And this demographic information is going to allow us to figure out how representative the folks who show up to these hearings are of their broader communities. And so specifically, we're able to learn whether or not they own a home, how old they are, what their partisan um, identification is, how long they've lived at a particular address, whether they're frequent voters in local elections. And using a name matching algorithm, we're actually able to estimate the probability that someone belongs to a particular racial or ethnic background. And so perhaps surprising no one who's been to one of these hearings, there are really stark differences between commenters at these hearings and the broader population. So one thing I wanna stress about this chart here is that we're actually comparing the demographics of commenters at these hearings to voters. We have this demographic data from the voter file that we use as our uh, point of comparison. And we know that voters themselves are already somewhat more privileged than their broader communities. And so again, I just wanna stress here that this is in some ways like a conservative estimate of how unrepresentative the folks at these hearings are. So they're somewhat more likely to be men. They're somewhat more likely to be white. They are dramatically by over 20 percentage points more likely to be over the age of 50. And they're dramatically more likely to be homeowners. Latinx people turn out to be particularly underrepresented at these forums. So Latinx people are about 8% of the voters in these 97 cities and towns in Massachusetts. They were only 1% of the commenters in these cities or towns. Um, the city of Lawrence, Massachusetts really stands out for me in illuminating um, just how sort of underrepresented Latinx people are at these forums. So Lawrence, Massachusetts is 75% Latinx. Um, it's overwhelming majority Latinx population. Over this three year period, only one of 42 commenters who showed up to a planning or zoning board hearing in Lawrence had a uh, Latinx surname. So again, when we think about um, sort of representativeness in these forums, there are really concerning disparities that our data illuminate. What's more, the people who show up to these hearings, shocking no one who's been to one of these hearings, are overwhelmingly opposed to the construction of new housing. Only 14% of people show up to a planning or zoning board period over this three year period to support a new housing development. And this opposition makes sense when we consider the nature of these hearings. So the construction of new housing presents concentrated costs and diffuse benefits. So thinking back to that Cambridge housing development that I used to open this presentation. So we can think about, you know, those four condominium units. Um, the, the benefits of those four condominium units are highly diffuse, right? If we build those four units, there will be maybe like a teeny, teeny, teeny effect on housing prices in Cambridge, but sort of one housing development doesn't have a really perceptible impact on housing prices. We need to be building lots and lots of housing and increasing the supply by a sizable amount in order to have this really marked impact on the housing supply. So yes, it's good to build new housing, but for any one housing development, the benefit is going to be quite diffuse and hard to measure and consequently not particularly motivating, right? Most people, and I confess even I as someone who believes deeply that we need to be building more housing. I'm not someone who goes to every public hearing in my community um, about every single housing development being proposed. Um, so on the one hand, supporters aren't likely to be highly motivated to show up to every one of these hearings. But the cost of those new developments is quite concentrated. So thinking about the experience of living next door to that new development, 
it's, you know, you're going to have to listen to a lot of construction noise. And if they're, you know, doing uh, parking underground, you're going to have to listen to blasting, which is objectively terrible. Um, you're going to potentially have your view changed in a way that you don't like. Um, maybe there's going to be new decks on this property that will impinge on your privacy in some ways, or maybe they're cutting down trees, right? We can they'll go on and on with the ways that new developments can create really concentrated costs for the people in those immediate surroundings. And so as a consequence, new housing is always going to be more motivating to opponents than supporters. Because for those opponents who are facing like their trees getting cut down or they're you know having to listen to construction noise, that's motivating in a way that the diffuse benefits of building new housing simply aren't um, for any individual project. So thinking about the reasons that folks gave, um, we coded these reasons into a number of different categories, and a couple of things really stood out to us. Um, the first is that opponents are relatively likely to cite these broader community level concerns about traffic or the environment or flooding, right? So they're really thinking about you know, this broader um, perceived degradation to their neighborhoods. Supporters, in contrast, are relatively more likely to talk about affordability and the importance of building new housing um, to make their communities more affordable. To give you guys a sense of sort of whether being so strongly opposed to housing is unrepresentative broader community opinion, one of the things that we were able to do in Massachusetts was actually compare sort of the percent of a community that showed up to a hearing in support of or in opposition of new housing um, with a ballot referendum called Chapter 40B. So in an ideal world, I would have had public opinion data on sort of how much folks in these different cities and towns supported or opposed the construction of a variety of types of new housing. Um, but that kind of pooling data doesn't really exist across all 97 cities and towns. Um, but fortunately, we actually had a pretty good proxy in the form of the 2010 ballot referendum for Chapter 40B. So Chapter 40B, what it allows, it allows um, developers who are proposing at least 25% affordable housing in their developments to bypass local zoning laws if the community they're proposing the development in doesn't have a lot of affordable housing. So the threshold the state of Massachusetts uses is 10%. So if a community has less than 10% affordable housing, a developer proposing affordable housing can bypass local zoning laws. And so in 2010, there was actually a referendum on this, um, this piece of legislation, which has been around since the 1970s. Um, and it passed with a majority of the vote. Um, and so what we were able to do is plot the percentage of a city or town that supported this referendum against the percent of people who showed up to one of these public hearings in support of or in opposition to the construction of new housing. And what we found was that overwhelmingly in almost every single community, more people, a higher proportion of people voted for that ballot referendum than showed up in support of new housing in their communities. And we think Cambridge, Massachusetts is especially illustrative. So in Cambridge, 80% of voters showed up to support chapter 40B um, in this 2010 referendum. In contrast, only 40% of commenters at Cambridge Planning and Zoning Board meetings show up in support of the construction of new housing. So there's this real disjoint between what people say in the abstract they want um, for housing and affordability in their communities, and then what actually happens at these hearings about the construction of new housing. So what, how, how are these folks effective, right? So one question you might have is, okay, this is compelling. You've now shown me with data that the people who show up to these hearings are really opposed to the construction of new housing um, and that they're unrepresentative of their broader communities. But so what? Maybe they're not all that persuasive. Maybe the people on the planning and zoning boards don't really listen to them. Um, but we actually found in our examination of the data that these folks are really highly persuasive. And so one way in which they're persuasive is they wield expertise. So a lot of people who show up to these hearings are in their professional lives, at least somewhat adjacent to development. They're architects, they're lawyers, they're realtors, um, or they'll use their expertise maybe in a way you wouldn't expect to try to fight new housing. So one that stands out to me is a doctor who showed up to a hearing who cited his medical expertise about the importance of emergency vehicles to be able to get to a hospital quickly to say that you know, he was concerned about traffic from this proposed housing development. 
right? And that expertise can be really persuasive um, to sort of folks on these planning and zoning boards. And it can also be dissuasive to other people who show up to these hearings who might have spoken, but then maybe feel intimidated by the kinds of dialogue that are happening in these forums. So the second way that we think um, neighborhood defenders can be really effective is via organization. So a lot of times in the meeting minutes, neighborhood associations or councils play a really important role in organizing their communities, often in opposition to new housing. And they sometimes actually will bring public officials along, like a city councilor, to hearings, which in practice is usually the kiss of death for a proposed development if an elected official shows up in strong opposition to the new housing. Um, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, we identify in a number of cases, um, folks who show up these, these hearings who either threaten or eventually file lawsuits, um, which are incredibly expensive for developers, even if they ultimately end up being unsuccessful. So we identified multiple folks who showed up to hearings accompanied by lawyers who are themselves lawyers. And we were actually able to link some of the individuals in our data with lawsuits that were actually filed in the Massachusetts land court. So sort of taking these results in concert, what we found was that both advantaged people and advantaged communities, right? So not just like within a community, the most advantaged people show up. And then if we're starting to compare across different communities, there's higher turnout at these hearings in the more advantaged communities. So advantaged people and advantaged communities are more likely to show up in opposition to the construction of all types of new housing. We found this pattern persisted for large and for small projects, as well as for affordable projects and for market rate projects. Projects. And what this means, it has really important distributional consequences for a metro area, that advantage places end up being protected from development, and less advantaged places actually are more vulnerable to development. And this phenomenon creates challenging coalition politics, because wealthy areas are better able to organize to oppose housing. And developers, they know this. They, they are well aware. We did many, many interviews with developers, and they all have an incredibly clear sense of the areas where they think they're going to encounter really high opposition. And they often deliberately avoid those communities in order to get around that really expensive neighborhood opposition. And so what this means is gentrifying areas bear the brunt of development pressures. And this makes some of those communities really reluctant to endorse solutions that are oriented around building more market rate housing. In the aggregate, at the regional level in many places, we really do need to be building more market rate housing as well as affordable housing. But this ends up being a really tough selling point, understandably, in gentrifying communities who feel like they have really borne the brunt of this. And so we've actually seen in several states really interesting coalition partners um, between some of the most exclusionary affluent suburbs and um, really you know, much less privileged communities facing gentrification pressures who come together to fight um, zoning reform at the state level. And this has been most sort of salient as a challenge in the state of California, which has over you know, the last few legislative cycles tried and failed to pass significant zoning reform. So, you know, we're all on Zoom now. So one question I've been getting um, about our community engagement work is, has the Zoom era fixed any of these problems? Has it solved any of these disparities? Um, and so one of the things my, my co-authors and I were really interested in this too. So starting in March, we actually collected um, data from the exact same cities and towns, um, basically from March through September, trying to compare the demographics of participants um, in the, the recent Zoom era to the ones from our three-year period, 2015 to 2017. And so we find it, it doesn't really fix a lot. So people are still super opposed to housing who show up to these forums. Um, some disparities maybe improve modestly, but participants actually still skew older. Um, so even with you know, all the concerns about the accessibility of Zoom um, to seniors, we do actually find that um, participants at these hearings still skew over 50. They're much more likely to be homeowners, and they're still overwhelmingly opposed to the construction of new housing. Um, and so I think what these, this shows is just because we make it easier to participate doesn't mean we're going to get a more representative subset of folks. And this, this fits with like a lot of political science research that suggests that making things easier is part of the battle, but we also have to create forums where people are actually going to be interested in participating and understanding these dynamics. 
So when we think about policy reform, um, sort of one thing I want to stress is that we view land use reform as really critical. We think it's like you, you can't do a whole lot of housing reform if you don't deal with our land use problems first. But I want to stress we think it's only a part of addressing the nation's housing crisis. And yeah, I bold this, I put it in red to really emphasize this, that just fixing our zoning is not going to fix a lot of the housing inequities and housing problems that we have in the United States, right? It cannot be the only solution in isolation. But we do think in order to be building the right amount of housing in communities that really need it, these high opportunity areas with high quality public goods and lots of job opportunities, we need to make it easier to build in those places. We need to make it easier to build high density housing um, in those communities, right? And so allow it by right. Don't have these lengthy permitting processes. We also think there are things that you can do at the margins to make the meetings themselves more effective. Perhaps at a basic level, in those communities where we only notify property owners, we could start to notify um, renters as part of the abutter notification process. We also wonder whether a waiting period on decisions might be helpful. Um, and so there's a, this is actually has precedent in a lot of judicial decision making. The way um, that most of these meetings unfold right now is that um, immediately after hearing from a lot of you know, disproportionately opposed to new housing folks, your neighbors who are really opposed to a new project, people on the planning board or the zoning board have to make an immediate decision. Um, and it can be really tempting after hearing from all these folks who are upset about a proposed housing development to at least like try to find a compromise solution. Um, and we wonder whether if there weren't some kind of waiting period, you know, a three day or a week long period between the public hearing and when the board made a decision that that sort of recency bias, this powerful psychological phenomenon wouldn't be as influential in decision making in a way that could potentially be beneficial um, to our housing policy. Finally, we believe that local governments need to be a lot more transparent about when studies are required for proposed housing and what constitutes an acceptable study. We saw over and over again that developers would present, say, a traffic study and then be told at a hearing that no, you know, after the neighbors objected that no, 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 that traffic study wasn't right and you have to do another traffic study. We heard from developers who ended up having to do four traffic studies for a housing development um, as people people who are angry about the proposed housing essentially wanted to cherry pick results. And so we think it's really important for the integrity of this process that cities and towns lay out clearly what makes an acceptable traffic study, what makes an acceptable parking study, and then really stick to those guidelines. It ensures that the developer can't cherry pick a study and it ensures that the community can't cherry pick a study. Finally, um, local governments can't do this on their own. There's no amount of meeting reform or zoning reform that is going to ensure that we produce the supply of housing that we need to meet demand. Um, so federal and state level resources are also absolutely critical for improving affordability. Um, and we are just not going to be able to solve this problem alone at the local level. Cities really need support from higher levels of government um, that has been unfortunately absent in uh, recent years. So thank you so much um, for attending this. And I'm really looking forward um, to your comments um, and thoughts on this work. So thank you. I'm going to stop the share now. Catherine, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, gosh, a lot of food for thought. Um, and I'm glad you and your colleagues were the ones to digest all of that data. <laughs> My goodness. But it's um, so important um, to share the results. And we appreciate you being here. Um, just a couple of things came to mind immediately. Um, something I think about often um, as someone who is trained as an urban planner and responsible for talking to different types of groups of people um, is just the different languages that's involved here. I mean, we've got government language, we've got the law, we've got architecture and urban planning and preservation. And, and so I think that makes it more of a, again, more of a privileged conversation and um, affects accessibility. Um, the other thing too is just our the depleting resources for local journalists um, and how if we're not able as citizens and neighbors to attend every single meeting, um, being able to look online at the local paper the next day 
um, and, and see what happened. You know, I, I can't make every meeting. And so just trying to rely on our local journalists who have their hands tied, um, it seems, um, these days. Uh, so those were just a couple of things that came to mind. Um, I'm going to check our questions here. We've got some, um, some great folks in the audience. Um, I, are you able to see these as well, Catherine? Yeah, I can see them as well. And I, I just sort of first respond to your really great yeah. point about the, the local journalism side um, that, you know, we know across a lot of different local political arenas that the, the death of local journalism is so problematic. And one thing that we frankly haven't studied um, in, in my other research agenda, I actually studied the political effects of misinformation. So it's something that I've thought about in the context of zoning is as we have the death of local news, um, it seems like a lot of like Facebook forums around city politics have risen up to take their place and provide people information on things where there's not like sort of robust journalistic sources. And so I do wonder about the proliferation of like conspiracy theories about developers um, and zoning, re rezonings and things like that. Just in my own experience um, as a practitioner, I serve on my town's um, local planning board and I have seen just complete misinformation get spread among the community um, on these forums about um, yeah, various developer conspiracies. And so I do really, I, I think that would be a really rich area of study to unpack sort of thinking about how um, how the loss of really good rigorous reporting on these hearings and development politics is reshaping our local communities. Absolutely. Um, if, if for our audience members, if you'll please type your um, questions in the chat, um, try to be concise if you can, just so that I can um, get these to Catherine. Um, We've got a comment based on uh, an observation, uh, the tradition of many neighborhood meetings um, that someone would like to ask about is that the thin, uh, thinly guises an opportunity to, oh, sorry. Okay, in your research, Catherine, have you found um, any municipalities that have implemented or even considered making either the planning board meetings or individual board members voting outcomes in order to help mitigate some of the inequity you identified uh, in the current processes. So is the thought here that the board members should be voted in or that we should be publicizing their voting outcomes more? Um, I just wanna make sure that I understand the proposal um, before, before I give my views on it. Yeah, and I, Maybe we can um, invite Ralph to unmute himself if he's able and, and clarify that question a bit more. Yeah, hi, Dr. Einstein, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I guess my question is, is there any proposed policies that you've seen in your research uh, that would allow a little bit of lack of transparency? I think you, you identified essentially that the planning board or the zoning boards can be beholden to the vocal minority. So is, is there any other ways that are being considered to try to sort of shield that and make them more of a, a delegate for to represent the broader community rather than a representative just of the people who show up to those meetings? This is such a good question. It actually speaks to like much bigger political science conversations and democracy conversations about sunshine laws. Um, that one of the, you know, we, we have sunshine laws, I think for very good reasons to try to make politics more accessible to the public, to open it up to the public, to shield these proceedings from corruption, um, right? I mean, development politics has a, in particular has a very ugly history of um, corruption in America. Um, so there, there were really good impulses and noble impulses behind these sunshine laws, but there's really good research that suggests that it may be having these important unintended consequences because we no longer have forums. Um, it's not like, so I'm on a planning board. It is actually not legal for me to talk with my fellow planning board members about redevelopment issues um, unless we are right now in our Zoom forum because it's uh, the Zoom era or at an actual public hearing. Like we cannot, um, with the exception of sort of very specific circumstances. There are a few times where we can have executive sessions, but for the most part, our proceedings have to be open to the public. And so there isn't really this like informal opportunity for board members to to talk to each other um, and potentially say, okay, we know that like the 20 people who showed up are really mad, but what is actually the public interest, right? I think we can't have those kinds of frank conversations because of public hearings. So it's a trade-off, um, but yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, and that brings up a, so an observation I've had is just, you know, some people sit on commissions for decades and have plenty of institutional knowledge, but just, but board compositions do change. And so the training 
you know, and how is that equitable throughout a state or a region, um, just so that developers have some sort of, um, you know, even playing field. Um, and because, you know, every, every board and commission and a municipality has its own <laughs> um, character. Um, I, we had a, Mary um, made a comment that is something else I've observed in person is just how um, attendance can be, at hearings can be exclusionary um, because of, you know, the time it takes to, to carve that out. And um, very often it's, it's me and, and other people from um, local organizations and a retired population. Uh, can you comment on that? Just uh, for example, our planning and historic district commissions take place at 445 on a Monday or Tuesday. That's part of my schedule, but that um, isn't an easy time for a lot of people. Yeah, so one observation I've had is like, there's no good time to have a four hour zoning board meeting. So, you know, and my planning board in, in an effort to be accommodating to parents and to people with full time jobs, they hold the meetings at seven. Um, and I'll just say as someone who both works full time and has two young children, it's brutal. The nights where I have to stay up late and then, you know, get up early the next morning to do my parenting and my job. Um, you know, I, I love housing and I love zoning, so I'm really committed to this. Um, but I, I think it's really hard. And I think the very nature of the way that we conduct these hearings is absolutely dissuasive. Um, and one of the things that I would love for local governments to think about is whether there's just, there's a better way to get public input than meetings, right? Like there's a deep attachment in urban planning to the public process. And again, I think this comes from a really good place when we think about what happened during urban renewal. I mean, you guys are in Providence, so you you live this more than people in most cities, sort of what the consequences are to the built environment of putting highways where neighborhoods used to be, right? This developer dominated process was really problematic. So we know that we have to do something different um, and we know we need community engagement, but I think we as a sort of broader field have really struggled to define what that could community engagement looks like and what constitutes actually reaching out to the communities. Um, but my take from our research and now my practitioner experience on a planning board is like it cannot just be what happens at those hearings, um, because I think there, a three hour hearing is just completely anathema to like what most normal people want to do with their evenings. Have, have, amen. I, I also am remembering the comment you made about perhaps proposing sending um, letters, not only to property owning abutters, but renters as well. I happen to be a renter in Providence and my landlord lives out of state. So he, presumably he receives notices about development in our neighborhood um, and yet he's not here, I am. Uh, and I just thought that was a really interesting um, proposal um, of, of reaching more people who are live with the consequences. Yeah, this is one of the things that boggles my mind about American politics is, you know, when we think about voting at the national level, I mean, there are places where it's deeply unjust and, you know, we could talk about like voter ID laws and things that are maybe, you know, excluding people from the franchise. But one of the things that boggles my mind about local politics is a number of different ways that we explicitly privilege homeowners um, and are sort of fine with that. The way that we invite homeowners associations to the table in some governments, the way that we send notifications just to homeowners, um, the way that we privilege, you know, if you think about California and how people who are current landowners um, have been allowed to sort of keep very low property taxes in a way, um, you know, because of Prop 13, like there's, I could come up with like a dozen different examples of the way that we privilege home ownership um, in our democracy um, in a way that, yeah, it's just, it's sort of stunning when you think about it, the way that renters are just excluded from these conversations. All right, I see one here from Doris. Um, Catherine, did you find any distinction and reaction of speakers between projects they cre that created new units and those that were dedicated to rehab? Um, which of course brings it back to our preservation um, umbrella. Yeah, so people hate everything. That's like, you know, our, our big, uh, the big overwhelming takeaway is there wasn't like one type of project where people were like, yes, that one. But I think your broader point is well taken that my hunch is if we had many, many years of data that would allow us to do those kinds of fine grained comparisons, um, 
while people hate everything about new housing, they really hate teardowns. Um, that is something that when you talk about sort of tearing down a building, it feels like a much bigger neighborhood change. It often really dramatically shifts the footprint of a building. And so I think there, there are aspects of rehab that people are generally a lot more supportive of because it doesn't create this sort of incredible visual transformation in a community. So I, we haven't looked at that kind of fine grained analysis, but I, I do suspect that people are at least modestly more supportive of rehab developments. But again, couching that with the broader comment that if only 14% of people are showing up in support of new housing, there's not like a groundswelling of support of these hearings. Sure. Well, that, that's some, some bright spot in your data then uh, for a preservationist. Uh, I noticed that our executive director, Brent Runyon, um, asked, were there any other reasons for opposition that your data um, shined a light on other than parking and traffic, which you know, trees and parking um, uh, are big around here when it comes to neighborhood opposition. And understandably, but there are bigger community problems, I think. Yeah, so one of the questions I've gotten is like, how much of this is like people genuinely worried about the trees and how much of it is that they've learned that trees are a socially acceptable way for them to talk about maybe some like darker class or race-based biases? And the answer is, I unfortunately can't tell by reading beating minutes um, what's inside people's heads. Um, a few interesting anecdotes that I've heard um, but in talking with public officials about meeting minutes is they're like, oh, you know, we sanitize those, right? Like off the record, obviously, you know, which is because that's not in compliance with sunshine laws. But I think in some cases, there are probably like pretty objectionably racist things that don't make it into the meeting minutes because cities and towns don't want them in there. Um, so that's sort of one thing to think about. Like when you're getting data from official government transcripts, um, the, the per city clerk may have a reason to transcribe things in a particular way. Um, but more generally, I think, it's, it's so hard to know what's inside people's heads and what what the cycle, sometimes they might not even know that like their their fears of change and new people moving in actually, you know, they're, they're deep inside. And so they manifest instead by worrying about traffic from like 10 new cars in the neighborhood. So, um, so yeah, it's a great question. Well, um, I see a question from Sarah Scott up in Cambridge. Um, do you have any suggestions for bridging the gap um, between clashes between the more progressive ideas that the city staff have from our communities, for our communities. Um, so essentially, is the question like, how do we get from sort of the division between what planners, the progressive vision that planners have with like what the community wants? Yeah, this is, I think it, this I is the great challenge. I the spirit of the question. Yeah, yeah. And this is something, I mean, Cambridge um, just had an incredible, you know, very lengthy debate about a major zoning change called the affordable housing overlay, which just went through. Um, we're essentially in Cambridge, I think this is like a nice illustrative example of sort of what planners have to do for this process. Um, so in Cambridge, um, they have now approved a policy that allows for a dramatic buy right up zoning of neighborhoods if the development is a 100% affordable housing development. So it's meant to really significantly relaxed the zoning code for the production of subsidized housing. Um, and it was born very much of sort of an alliance um, between what some of the progressive planners in Cambridge wanted and also a very well mobilized group of activists um, called the Better Cambridge. And so, um, but it also required like a really long community engagement process. This was not an overnight thing. Um, there were various points that it failed. There was like a new election um, that brought in some more pro-housing folks in the city council. Um, so I think my, my broader answer to this is that you need a lot of community engagement and maybe some pressure from elected officials on this too, um, which is going to be easier in a big city like Cambridge um, or Providence that has city councils as opposed to some of the smaller towns um, in Massachusetts, which have a town meeting form of government where it's going to be much harder to sort of have a big election wave oriented around development issues. But I think we shouldn't forget the value of like voting in local elections and telling our public officials what we want um, in our built communities. And we have um, a Cambridge follow up question. Um, Marlene wanted to know um, what happened with the housing project that you started your presentation with. Yeah, so it ended up being three units, each with um, two parking spaces, and they each sold for somewhere around 1.5 million. I um, serve on my neighborhood association's board and um, com community development um, committee, which is interesting because it's a very you know specific and narrow one one slice of Providence uh, area to think about. And 
um, you know, so I can wear a little bit of a different hat than I do in my day job um, at PPS. But it's it's interesting, you know, we welcome reviews of projects and want to engage with developers and architects. Um, but sometimes, you know, we have so little authority as a neighborhood or no authority as a neighborhood associations, just reputation and the power of support. Um, so in writing our comment letters, it's all it's it's always this tension of, okay, we have one bite of the apple here. What, what can we try to compromise um, and to prove that necessity or desire to the um, planning commission um, so that the developer will, can earn you know, the, the support of our group? Um, it's always an interesting um, you know, balancing act. Um, all right. Yeah, I was Yes, I was going to say, I feel like this is part of the challenge of how we do housing in US where so much of it, rather than being community level conversations about like, what is the land use that we want, right? So rather than having meetings with different neighborhoods and different constituencies and saying, how should we think about our city's land use, and then let developers essentially build up to whatever we decide the limits, the right limits are, right? We should set good limits, let them build up to it and let city governments potentially extract concessions for neighborhoods. But instead of having this sort of weird process where like different communities have to mobilize to maybe extract some concessions from developers, but it realistically only happens in the most privileged places, I think is a problematic and inequitable way to do this. Yeah, and it's also, I mean, through the zoning, it's so much easier to quantify, you know, heights and mass and, um, but how does that translate to the quality um, of what, what's coming and how the neighborhoods are, are changing. Um, I'm just trying to scroll through everybody, make sure I haven't, this is not my best skill of, of reading and trying to listen at the same time. Um, we did speak about combating misinformation on social media. Um, what else do we have? Um, well, Catherine, I just wanted to ask what, um, as preservationists, um, you know, there's plenty of, we, we don't want to be just the no people. No, you can't do that. No, you don't have our support. No, no, no. Um, that's not it at all. And we know that, but I understand how that perception um, is, is commonplace. Um, you know, there are plenty of opportunities in neighborhoods across Providence for infill and for um, rehabilitation. Um, so it, um, I guess what I'm asking, in, in your mind and in reflecting on your research, what role can preservation play um, in some of these inequities of just public participation? Yeah, so this is something I'm really torn about uh, because we know, unfortunately, from the data that historic districts um, are very much associated with like more expensive housing, with enabling sort of neighborhood defenders to fight new housing, and maybe outcomes that, you know, again, shield some areas. And, you know, one area um, where I really think about this a lot is in San Francisco, where we think about like, you know, the really famous painted ladies, which are beautiful and wonderful. And it's great to, you know, have that kind of a landmark, but that neighborhood essentially gets completely completely shielded from development, while the mission experiences like incredible gentrification and, you know, thinking beyond just San Francisco, like Oakland experiences this tremendous gentrification. And so historic preservation, unfortunately, I think has this way of privileging um, affluent white areas and shunting development to communities of color. And so I think that part is really hard um, because it comes against, I think this, yeah, I suspect for a lot of people in the audience and certainly for me, um, I think old neighborhoods are beautiful, walkable and sort of a lot of what we want in the urban landscape. I live in a wonderful old house. I love, um, I love the charm of it. And so I hate the idea of those things getting completely torn down too. And so I think the question is like, what is the right model? We don't wanna just create cities that are mausoleums. We have to acknowledge that sort of cities have to be dynamic, they have to change they have to grow. And when they're not growing and changing, that's a sign of something being really wrong. Um, and so to look to models, I think a lot about what some of the European cities have done. Um, when we think about walking in you know, Paris and London, these are places that have, I think, particularly Paris, actually, Paris is probably a better model than London in terms of actually having built up a lot more and kept pace with some of the housing demand in the city, while also retaining a lot of the historic charm. And so I think thinking about how we can strike that balance where maybe we're, we're a little more tolerant of additions on some beautiful old buildings if right. they preserve the facade, right? Like that's sort of one potential way of thinking about it. Um, but I, I completely agree that it's, I think, 
a really tough tension to acknowledge the fact that historic preservation in many communities privileges um, advantaged people. Yeah. Uh, one building that I am constantly thinking about in Providence is our empty uh, Superman building, the, still the tallest building in the state, 92 years old, uh, formerly the Industrial Trust Building. And, you know, as a preservationist, we have a housing crisis, crisis in the city and we have a vacant building. Now, granted, it takes money and creative creativity to, you know, bridge the gap there, but this is an opportunity in my mind, no matter what happens, no matter how we adapt in terms of working and the types of jobs we have or schooling or whatever, as the you know, pandemic has laid bare, there will always be a need for housing. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that we can translate um, that building, which was offices, uh, into some residential units. Um, to, I just think it would be a win-win, but I'm trying to convince others. Um, I've got a question here. What does a healthy community, what does healthy community engagement even look like? Has the pendulum of public input swung too far? That's a great question. Yes. So I absolutely think the pendulum um, for public input has swung too far um, in the realm of housing development. And it's one of these things that I find really striking because we don't really do the kinds of things we do for housing development for any other policy arena. Like when I think about local politics around policing, it's not like our police departments are listening to the folks who show up to public hearings in the same way, right? Like I, I would identify policing as an area where we might benefit from a lot more public input. Um, but I think housing development is an area where we have swung so far in the direction of essentially reifying a public process that really privileges the voice of the 12 people who show up in a room. Um, and so I would love for us to think creatively about what public engagement could look like um, in a way that's more constructive. Um, so the first is we need to define when it is reasonable to have public engagement. I think you guys have probably captured this from this talk. I don't think it's a great idea to have public engagement every single time someone wants to build anything in a city. But I do think we should have a lot of public engagement around setting city wide land use. Like I think having those kinds of community level conversations would actually attract with proper recruitment a broader subset of the population. Because while it is irrational if you're strongly supportive of new housing to show up for the development of some, you know, every townhouse in your community, it's actually really reasonable to show up for a conversation about a major master planning or rezoning. Um, and this is something they found in Minneapolis when they got rid of single family zoning and got rid of their parking minimums is they were able to do a much broader community engagement around those kinds of big proposals. Okay, but my second thing is we can't just do meetings. I think we need to be considering more outreach, right? So in Minneapolis, when you talk to the planners there who were able to get these really progressive land use reforms through, they talk a lot about going out into the community, which you know during the pandemic is of course impossible, but there will hopefully be a world someday where we can go to farmers markets and to churches and to other community spaces where people congregate, um, not because they're interested in land use, but because they're members of a community. And you use those uh, gatherings as opportunities to talk with people about land use. Finally, I think we need to be thinking creatively about um, on soliciting people's opinions online. So one cool approach that I've seen um, from a local startup in Boston called Co-Urbanize, they've worked both with developers and with local governments, is what they'll do is buy a proposed development, they'll put up a little QR code and they'll say something like there was a big billboard, like, what would you like to see here? And then you can walk by, swipe up your phone and give them the, their feedback about what you would like to see there. And it actually ends up being much more positive feedback because it turns out if you ask people, what would you like, they're much more likely to give you something useful than if you ask them a question like, here's a really specific proposal, tell me everything you hate about it. Like, I feel like it, it speaks to human nature that when you see a specific proposal, that's going to be your response. And so I think we need to be asking better questions of the community if we want higher quality community engagement. Oh, that's, that's such good information. Um, we do have a follow-up question, I think, to what you just said is how or should, um, how do you think that, that that individual special permit projects or zoning petitions, how would that apply? Totally, yeah. So, I mean, the, I, right, I just gave you like the pie in the sky, like here's how urban planning could be better, but you know, <laughs> the people on this call are probably like, well, unfortunately we live in the real world where I still have to get special permits. So what do I do? How do I get this better? Um, and I would still argue that 
conversations with the neighborhood in advance um, where you ask for sort of positive feedback. Like, what would you like to see here? Um, how can we make this um, something that serves the community? Because again, I think when you ask the neighborhood, like, here's three units of housing I'm going to put in and I'm definitely putting in two parking spaces and you can't stop me. Um, th those kinds of conversations are naturally going to elicit negativity. And I think if you can get buy-in from a broader subset of the community, there's always going to be the usual suspects who show up and fight development. So the question is, how do you mobilize your supporters? And I think you mobilize them by asking questions like, what would you like to see here? Um, rather than here's a proposal that I have, well, give me your feedback, um, right. which is someone who grades papers all the time like that. It just, it it brings a different part of your brain out. Yeah. Oh, that's good. And I think too, you know, I, when there's a situation that happens that's legal, you know, by right zoning, um, and you hear complaints about it, then sometimes the commissioners or city staff will say, well, you know, this is in our zoning. So is there any space in between the um, infrequent and laborious task of redoing comprehensive zoning plans or zoning ordinances and the you know micro level of here's one project that's allowed because this is what's on the books right now is there any space for having or any examples you know of for having constructive conversations um, between citizens and and the city just a more intermediate um, reaction i guess or input? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, you know, what are what are ways that you could have sort of these informal community engagement processes? It's something that on my planning board, we're, we're actually having our goal setting meeting in a month where this is one of the things oh, we're fun. going to talk about. Yeah, no, it should be good. Um, but that's, I, it's a great unanswered question is, you know, I, we are in my town looking to do a major rezoning right now. And so how can we work um, with folks on sort of helping helping them to you know, interpret zoning in the same way our planning department and our planning board are interpreting it, right? I think that's, it's a great question. Um, and I don't know, maybe the online era is going to let us have more creative options for doing this because I really just find like asking people to show up to meetings for any length of time in person is just, it's so hard and such a non-starter. Um, so I, community education is probably really important though. Maybe that's the place to end is like actually having really transparent conversations with folks, maybe even recording like little asynchronous lectures where we talk about these issues. Um, you know, getting back to the misinformation where we started this conversation. Um, there's so much misinformation out there about how local zoning works and how developers use that zoning. And I think a lot more transparency on that side of things would be very helpful. Right. And I think too, I mean, not everyone needs to or will be a zoning expert in every place, um, but these things, you know, become very personal when the development is in your backyard. Um, and then, you know, I, I often, you know, come across folks who it's their first HDC meeting or it's their first CPC meeting um, because they received the letter in the mail and, um, you know, they have concerns about a certain development. So it there is a an embiism about this process that it, you know, until you have it um, or need to deal with it, you know, who, why would you even think about the agenda of the City Plan Commission? Um, totally. And I think that's, yeah, one thing to take away from our data too, is there's definitely the usual suspects. Like there's a few frequent flyers who are like, I'm going to attend every one of these hearings and tell the planning board why what they're doing is illegal. Um, right. But then most people, the overwhelming majority, it's something like 80% of people basically show up to a meeting once and then never do it again. They're, they're the smartest ones, probably if all of us, they're like, that was enough zoning politics for me. Um, but they, they show up, I think, for the exact reason that you say, they get that notice in the mail and they're like, oh, wow, there's something getting built near me, I need to show up and say something. Um, and then a, in normal times, we have the spring clean of um, uh, college and graduate students who come because they've never been to a public hearing before and they've been told um, that they need to visit. All right, well, we're wrapping up here. If you've got any last minute burning questions for Catherine, um, please let me know in the chat. Um, Here's one. Uh, have you found that being more proactive in making information about development projects in the pipeline slash review process more accessible slash transparent um, on a city website mapping services helps combat misinformation and opposition? 
I think in general, yes, I think I see that with the important caveat that um, it depends upon where you live, because from what this is, again, anecdotal, I would love to do much more systematic research on this. This is really an area that you, if you check in with me in three years, I'll probably have something much more um, data driven to say. But there's a lot of variation in cities and towns um, and sort of whether they have a conspiratorial group there. Um, so there are some communities where there are very active groups that are frankly just not really responsive to facts and sort of if we take it outside the realm of development for a minute and just look at the broader literature on misinformation um people there there are some ways you can persuade people so i i think some facts can actually work and i think education can reach a subset of folks who are misinformed but there are some people who are just so deeply committed to a conspiratorial mindset and a conspiratorial way of thinking about their government operations um, that reaching those folks um, is incredibly challenging they have their own very entrenched set of facts and they interpret the entire world through that lens and you know again taking it outside development politics it's something we see right now in our national politics um one thing that actually really concerns me about the dissemination of conspiracy theories and misinformation on development projects um, on places like Facebook is that it decreases trust in this process, even among folks who don't hold those views. Um, so there's actually been research that shows that mere exposure to a conspiracy theory about government reduces the trust in government, even if you don't believe in the conspiracy. And so it's, it's just in a a sort of depressing thing to, to maybe leave us on uh, as we think about some of the way that social media may be distorting um, politics at all levels. Yeah, so not really a high note, but appropriate uh, for 2020. Well, Catherine, we're so grateful to you and for your time tonight. Um, thank you to all of you who joined us on a Monday evening. Um, this was such, like I said, such great food for thought. And I think I can I'm going to take a few days to think about it and apply it to my experiences here in, in Providence's public realm. Um, but thank you again uh, for the audience. If you would like to join us tomorrow night, same time, same channel, um, make sure that you're um, registered by 10 a.m. in the morning um, if you don't have the all, ac all access pass. Um, so thank you again, Catherine. Uh, I hope to see you someday up in, in Massachusetts. Uh, and I hope everyone has a good evening.